Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you to another live stream of Let Us Reason. And today's topic is going to be another special edition of that with us uh, in studio here virtually, our dear uh, brother, Robert Spencer, uh, otherwise known also for his blog, Jihad Watch, or the Jihad Watch, I should say. And uh, lately, uh, him and David Wood on David Wood's channel, they've been doing the, uh, the uh, Week in Jihad, I believe the name of the series. So if you don't know who he is, uh, you might want to go and explore Jihad Watch. Uh, just Google Robert Spencer or at least go to uh, Acts 17 Apologetics and see the many weekly updates that they do together, him and David Wood. The reason why we wanted to do this show today is that Robert has recently published a book called The Critical Quran, and he takes a look at some of the uh, troubling passages and teachings in the Quran that either oftentimes uh, our Muslim friends are aware of and they try to water it down or give you a different way of understanding it, or Oftentimes, they do not know even what it meant, and they try to come up with ways to uh, at least reinterpret it simply because maybe it's uh, an embarrassment. If you admit that the Quran is teaching on issues like violence, jihad, for instance, or that they try to use uh, some commentaries that suit their own interpretation. All that to say is that in this book, Robert is uh, taking a critical look at the Quran from a commentary standpoint primarily and sharing with us uh, some of the meanings behind various verses in the Quran. What does it mean, for instance, when it says qatilu or fight those? Does it really mean to just have a wrestling match or does it mean really a violent, uh, uh, basically, attack? Uh, and when is that required? Is it only at the times of peace or in the words of... Uh, uh, you know, Karen Armstrong, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Quran presents to us in an awesome, evil way, uh, how you ought to fight, uh, put it this way. So all that to say is that I ask Robert if he doesn't mind be basically coming in and doing this show with us. Uh, first, we want to promote the book, obviously, and I encourage each one of you to go and inspect this on Amazon. It'll give you uh, plenty of, um, you know, information about the table of content and a lot of parts of that book. But also, hopefully, this show will help you get a, a deeper insight from the author himself. So with that in mind, I want to welcome our dear brother and author, Robert Spencer. Robert, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Oh, thank you very much. It's very good to see you. And I, uh, I love the great work that you're doing, and I much appreciate you having me on. No problem, brother. We are uh, always, uh, you know, uh, all in the same front line uh, fighting uh, for the truth. So tell us, Robert, about the, the book. I mean, first of all, why did you call it the critical Quran? Well, this is, uh, uh, in the first place, it's the whole Quran. It's 114 surahs, plus actually two other apocryphal Shiite surahs that I added in an appendix. And it is a new translation that I did in uh, consultation with some native Arabic speakers and with a lot of comparison with earlier translations so that it's quite similar to earlier translations where those translations are accurate, but where they are uh, concealing the meaning in the Arabic for apologetic purposes, the critical Quran gives the real meaning. And then uh, we have, as you noted, commentary on the most of the passages in uh, the entire book explaining how mainstream Muslims understand the passages based on tafsir from Qurtubi, from Ibn Kathir, from uh, the two Jalals, the primary mainstream Sunni commentators on the Quran, so that that takes away the Islamic apologetic argument that we hear so often. You know, for many years, I quote the Quran and uh, Muslims say, and I'm sure you've heard this 10 million times also, uh, this is uh, taking it out of context. And so the context, wherever there is context, of course, the Quran being so decontextual, there really isn't a whole lot of context to start with. But the context is provided. But also many Muslims will say, well, this is not how we understand this. And it says kill them, but we really think it means give them a hug. You know, all this nonsense that people say. And so in the critical Quran, 
I give the commentary from the mainstream Muslim sources so that you can answer that. And you see, this is how these mainstream Muslim scholars that are still read and respected today understand the various passages. Also, there are variant readings. And you know, apologists have said, have claimed, they still claim, many of them, although Yasser Qadi and others have now admitted that there are variants. But they, Qadi and others have claimed that there are no changes in any of the manuscripts, that every last copy of the Quran is exactly the same as every other copy. So this is the first Quran that is published for a mainstream English-speaking audience that actually lists variant readings, like a study Bible, and gives you the understanding that not every Quran verse is exactly this way in every copy, but there's actually quite considerable variation. Right. And, and you know, uh, Robert, you know, uh, why do you think uh, our Muslim friends even in a day like this, where you have YouTube, where you have uh, social media, where you have people have access to the Quran and they have access to images of it, they have access to interpretations, they even have access to some of these commentators that you mentioned, like Ibn Kathir, for instance, available in English. And even though they cleaned it up a little bit, still, it does have some troubling things in it. Why do you think they keep insisting on the fact that either you and I don't understand it or because we don't know Arabic? Or we misinterpreted, or the, uh, uh, or so on and so forth. I mean, uh, it's it's too late for this uh, game playing. Well, I think that the the Arabic thing is really silly, because in the first place, it's true. I I know some Arabic, but I'm not fluent in Arabic. I can sit down and figure out the word by word what a Quran passage says, but I can't go and have a conversation with you in Arabic. This is no no problem to me. I, I freely admit this. But you don't have to have that in order to be able to read and understand what the Quran is saying, because we, I don't live in a bubble, you know? Uh, I don't live in a cone of silence and have no contact with other people. I've been in extensive contact with native Arabic speakers and scholars of the Quran for decades now. And so the idea that this is something that's closed off is really just an argument that is designed to throw sand in people's faces to deceive people into thinking that this is something that cannot possibly under be understood unless you'd undertake the massive job of learning another language and then maybe you might be able to understand it and so in other words you can't just pick up the book and read it now and get it and so it's designed to fool people into thinking that they can't really uh trust the evidence of their own judgment and their own senses when they read the translations. Of course, many translations are made by Muslims and for Muslims. And so there's no really no real reason for the Muslims to cast aspersions on them, except, of course, when they're inconvenient. And they keep doing this. Well, you know, what else can they do, really? I mean, what are they going to say? You don't know Arabic? What are they going to say that... Uh, uh, they see actually this is the this is the heart of the matter they know that what we're saying is true they know that what we're saying is accurate and so what can they say they can't meet us on a level playing field and say well you're right so they the only thing they can fall back on is that oh we must not really understand it or we must not be being honest about it like even now in the chat i saw some guy say don't lie about what the quran says the quran only teaches defensive jihad well, this is, you know, you and I know this is just a, a flat out lie, but a lot of people don't know. And that's one thing in the critical Quran that I show are the passages that are used to justify offensive jihad and how they are understood and explained by the commentators. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. I was going to say, uh, it's funny how uh, some of our Muslim friends, I, I want to uh, be careful to say not all of them, obviously, but some of them who are at least well learned. Uh, out of embarrassment, they'll try to use this, uh, you know, claim that, well, it's not what the Arabic says. You don't understand, uh, you know, what the commentators mean. And think, but somehow they give themselves the right to go to the Bible that is written in Hebrew and Greek. And somehow they're experts in what the yeah. uh, Hebrew and the Greek says. And they want to convince us that that's exactly what the Bible is saying. So with that in mind, I mean, let's use this, uh, you know, bogus claim by this person. Is there really just 
defensive, you know, jihad. And I mean, the word jihad itself tells me that the Quran does approve fighting that is bloody, even if it's defensive. Yes. Well, there's no doubt about that. I mean, you take, for example, chapter 8, verse 41, where the Muslims are told to give 20% of the spoils of war to the messenger. Well, how can I give you 20% of my interior spiritual struggle? If that's what all jihad is, that's ridiculous. What am I going to do? Give you 20% of my prayer? It's it, it doesn't make any sense unless you're talking about warfare. And then there are spoils of war. There's all the, the goods that you've stolen from the people that you've defeated and killed and their women and so on. And so then that you can give a fifth of to the messenger. But the idea that that's it, that that's all just that, that you can only do that in a defensive conflict is contradicted just on the face of it by passages such as 839, which says, fight them until there's no more persecution and religion is all for Allah. Well, if religion, okay, if I'm over here not fighting and I'm a Christian, then my religion is not all for Allah. Consequently, they have a responsibility before Allah to fight me, even if I'm not doing anything and minding my own business right here in my office. And so that's offensive. But if that is not true, then you are not fighting until religion is all for Allah. If you leave me alone as a Christian, then you're not obeying the Quran. So offensive jihad is absolutely warranted in the Quran and mandatory. And then, of I'll, course, in the critical Quran, I explain how you have to have in Sunni Islam, you have to have the caliph and all that. But that's another matter. You, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I want to confirm what you just said. And incidentally, I was a clubhouse a couple of days ago. There is a new app called Clubhouse, and I've been invited to by a number of wonderful brothers and sisters. And and I'm, I'm always careful not to really be involved in something that I'm not familiar with. So I, I was just listening. It was really actually past midnight, and there was a room in there, and someone was talking about you know some of these topics that you just mentioned about the Quran actually promotes violence and things like that. And a Muslim showed up. And uh, and and began to use the usual mantra. No, no, no. You guys don't understand what they got. No, the uh, uh, the prophet was so peaceful that he only had to fight those that fought him. And then he quoted from chapter two of the Quran, known as Surah Al-Baqarah, the cow, basically chapter two, starting from verse one ninety. And I'll, if if you would mind, I want to read that right now, and I want to just give people a context, and I want to ask you about abrogation, if you address that in your book or not. So let me yeah. go there now. I'm going to read it. Uh, obviously, I'm going to read in English because um, if I read in Arabic, uh, sadly, I'm going to lose most of my uh, viewers right now. So in English, starting chapter two, verse one nine, it says, "And fight in the cause of God, those who fight you." So that's what the Muslim was saying. Notice, only you fight those who fight you. But mm -hmm. do not commit aggression. God does not love the aggressor. And he stopped right here and began to lecture us on the fact that you see how wonderful the Quran is. You fight only those who fight you and you do not really transgress. The problem is he did not really proceed it to chapter verse 199, 192 and 193. So let me read them for you. 191 and kill them wherever you overtake them. Robert, does this sound like a... Um, Peaceful, basically, defensive jihad? No, no well, uh, certainly not even close. But the real kicker comes in 193, which is the same as 839 that I quoted a minute ago. Exactly. And fight them until there is no oppression, no fitna, basically. And worship becomes devoted to God. Do you know what this means? The whole earth, actually is covered with the banner of Islam. Where is defensive jihad here? There is no defensive jihad here. This is all offensive. And I actually have it here, if you don't, if you don't mind, I have it here from the critical Quran. Did you get yours yet? I sent one to you some time ago. I got ago. it signed by you, man, and it's Wonderful. on my shelf. That's great. Whoops. I hope I didn't disconnect there. I just... Uh, no, no, I'm still here. There. Oh, there we go. Okay. But I was going to okay. say this, uh, you know, while you're looking for it, I want to tell my audience here, our viewers, is that while verse 190, you can use it that way if you want to take it out of context. Guess what? It was abrogated by verse 191, 192, and 193. That follows. Yes. <laughs> and so actually the note on 193, this is the note on in the critical Quran. The command to fight until persecution, fitna, is no more and religion is for Allah. 
reveals that there is an aspect to the warfare enjoined by the Quran that is not purely defensive. Muslims must continue the war until Allah's law prevails over the whole world, which implies a conflict without end until that goal is attained. Now, this is just that's me talking, but then I give you the authorities. Ibn Hisham explains that this passage means that Muslims must fight against unbelievers until God alone is worshipped, which makes for a long war. Ibn Kathir explains that the verse means that Muslims must fight so that the religion of Allah becomes dominant above all other religions. Bulan Shahri from the 20th century says, the worst of sins are infidelity, kufr, and polytheism, shirk, which constitute rebellion against Allah the Creator. To eradicate these, Muslims are required to wage war until there exists none of it in the world, and the only religion is that of Allah. That's an open-ended declaration of war against every non-Muslim in all times and all places. So it goes on, but see, this is how the critical Quran works, that the understanding of the passages is given from the Islamic authorities, and the Islamic authorities, quite aside from what the lying apologists tell us in the West, the Islamic authorities are very clear that offensive jihad is meant in this passage. Not to mention that uh, a leader like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, al who uh, was the leader of ISIS, who has a PhD in the field, yeah. somehow our Muslim friends want to make him look like he didn't know what he was doing. Yes, I have seen, uh, I actually I had somebody get very angry with me for noting a professor a professor at some university, a Muslim professor, and he said al-Baghdadi was not a PhD in Islamic studies. Well, actually, he was a PhD in Islamic studies, but the guy was insisting that his PhD was in recitation of the Quran. Now, even that, it's a council of despair. It's absurd, because even if al-Baghdadi's PhD is in the recitation of the Quran. Are we supposed to believe that he's reciting it without any understanding whatsoever, without ever studying what the meaning of it is? The recitation is, is, is intrinsically tied to what the meaning is. Consequently, uh, well, you know, any, any argument will do to try to, to give, to fool people in the West into thinking that Islam is peaceful and that the jihadis have nothing to do with the real Islam. I mean, if that's the case, I should really earn seven PhDs in reciting the Quran the seven different ways. I mean, I, that's easy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so walk us through the structure of your book. Well, there's the Quran on top and on every page there are the notes underneath. You see the Quran in the larger print and then Below, you have the notes that correspond to the verses. The uh, chapters, the surahs also all have an introduction which explains what the traditional understanding is, whether they're from Mecca or Medina or a little bit of either, and what the scholars nowadays say about how uh, these things were sub clearly subject to editing and a great deal of change, contrary to the idea that it was all given to Muhammad in perfect form and transmitted in perfect form and codified by Uthman in perfect form, and we have it in perfect form. I've always emphasized where the text has been changed, where there are signs of editing and alteration so that people can understand. This is a very human book uh, that has been edited quite considerably, contrary to claims. So once people, um, you know, so basically did you touch on Asbab and Nizul, the reasons for the revelation sometimes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Wherever wherever possible and wherever appropriate. Uh, I give the Hadith that give the Asbab and Nizul and the, uh, or if there's something in the Sira literature that gives it, then I explain that. If they're contradictory stories, then I give them both. Like, for example, at the beginning of Surah 66, where we have the threat to by Allah that if the wives of Muhammad don't behave, then he will divorce them and give Muhammad better wives. And then I give the story about how Muhammad was uh, angering some of his wives in uh, skipping their turns and 
that the alternate story is that he was eating honey after he'd promised not to and had bad breath. And that uh, both of these stories, of course, are ninth century stories that appear to be written in order to explain a completely opaque passage rather than existing and the passage being a reflection of those stories. That is, the, the Asbam al Nazul literature all comes from 200 years after Muhammad, and so there's, or after Muhammad's supposed to have lived. So there's no necessary connection to the Quranic text really at all, but I do give the, uh, the explanations that are offered. And when it comes to, um, let's say someone is asking a very good question, um, uh, Jody Roger uh, Bishop, and a friend of ours, uh, he's saying, which Quran did you choose? I think he meant which reading. Did you use the Hafs, basically, the most common one, to uh, yeah. uh, rely on that? Okay. I did, but uh, where there are Warsh variants, I list as many Warsh variants as possible. And okay. as many other variants as I could find as possible. There were some that were a bit more complicated, and I didn't want to get into a lot of Arabic grammar for people who don't speak Arabic. Right. So I didn't, it, it doesn't have all the variants, but a good representational sample. And Excellent. As, as I say, even, even one uh, compared to most Qurans that are published in English, it's extraordinary even to have any of them listed at all. But uh, yeah, it's the Hafs version with a lot of Warsh variants noted and a lot of others. Cool. Now, when it comes to tafsir or commentaries, you did mention already a couple of names. Were you sticking only with specific names or did you uh, use a variety of them depending on the context and depending on the uh, reason behind the verse? Yeah, quite right. I use a wide variety. There's some that I went back to again and again because uh, of their importance with, within the Islamic tradition. And some people who I cite frequently because of their importance to modern Muslims, like uh, Maulana Maldudi. Uh, you go into any books, any Islamic bookstore in the country, and you'll find his writings. And he's internationally influential nowadays for understanding the Quran. And so I quote him quite a bit. But uh, I draw on a wide variety of others if they have something noteworthy to say about particular passages. Yes, and I'm glad you brought the Maududi uh, uh, into this because uh, not that many Muslims, by the way, know that a Maududi is almost as he's Ibn Kathir of the modern day. I mean, yeah, he so. is so clear and vicious in his explanation of things when it comes to jihad that he... Uh, you know, uh, has you know, he doesn't mince words. Let's put it this way. Yeah. He's clear about it. He he definitely cites Ibn Kathir and cites others as well. But uh, you know, somehow, uh, you know, our Muslim friends will overlook. I mean, I used to hear about Maududi all the time. He was one of our favorites, like Ibn Kathir, like Kortubi, like Tabari, like Al Jalalain. But now, all of a sudden, we have this young generation of Muslims in the West, like you know, uh, Yasser Qadi rightly says there is the Islam of the East and the Islam of the West. And that's what you're noticing. The Islam of the West somehow is a Christianized Islam. Islam of the East, in my view, is the orthodox, the true, the pure form of Islam when it comes to the scholars in there. They don't mend any words. They tell you exactly what the scholars of Islam throughout the history of Islam have understood these verses. I dare any student over there in the East to go to his imam or clerk and say, well, but I, I don't like it really this way. I don't know why even Kathir said it. Yeah, let's see how, how he's going to be definitely uh, received in that meeting. Yeah, you know, it's you bring up a very fascinating point, really. I debated a uh, uh, an Islamic scholar a few months ago who's actually at Harvard uh, School now where they... they Harvard University, where they have an Institute of Islamic Studies now, funded by Prince Abulid from Saudi Arabia. And uh, this young man had wanted to debate me for years. It's a long story, but the point is, is that he was very intent on showing that the Islamic tradition was peaceful and the usual nonsense about the jihad being only defensive and so on. And I pointed out that you're only saying this, we're only even having this discussion because we're in a Christian context, in a Christian culture, even if it's post-Christian now. And so there's the assumption that a religion has to be 
peaceful and tolerant and magnanimous. And so you want to cover up these aspects of Islam. Whereas if you were in Iran or Saudi Arabia, you wouldn't feel any compunction about being quite honest about what, what Islam teaches. And consequently, when you go to somebody like Maududi from Pakistan, he doesn't hesitate. He says, for example, uh, 929 of the Quran about fighting the unbelievers until they pay the jizya. And he says, non-Muslims have absolutely no right to wield the reins of power in any part of God's earth. And if they do, the Muslims have an obligation to dislodge them from that power by any means possible. Yes. You want to talk about that verse from your book, for instance, as an example? Yeah, you sure. Can pick any uh, of the fighting, you know, fatal uh, uh, basically passages, if you like, it's up to you. But to just give people a flavor of what that looks like. Absolutely, yes. Uh, 929 actually has the longest note in the entire book. You can see that there's just, uh, there it is, three lines of text at the top. Fight against those who do not believe in Allah or the last day and do not forbid what Allah and his messenger have forbidden and do not follow the religion of truth, even if they are among the people of the book until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel, and then of course on the next page, feel themselves subdued. But all the rest of it, is the footnote explaining about what that actually means. The fighting, the subjugation, what it means to be a dhimmi, and uh, I quote a great many people involved in this. For example, Al-Jalalain says that the verse specifies that Muslims must fight against those who do not follow Islam, which confirms and abrogates, he says, other religions, and Tafsir Asadi says the jizya may be taken from all the disbelievers, people of the book, and others. Although the verse just says people of the book only, that is, Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians, but not Hindus or Buddhists or something. But uh, this scholar says that it should be taken from them. Ibn Kathir says that the dhimmis must be disgraced, humiliated, and belittled. Therefore, Muslims are not allowed to honor the people of Zumma or ele elevate them above Muslims, for they are miserable, disgraced, and humiliated. The 7th century jurist, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyab, is said to have declared, I prefer that the people of the Dhimma become tired by paying the jizya, since, the, since he says, until they pay the jizya with their own hands in a state of complete abasement. Asuyudi elaborates that this verse is used as a proof by those who say that it is taken in a humiliating way, so that the taker sits and the zummi stands with his head bowed and his back bent. The jizya is placed on the balance and the taker seizes his beard and hits his chin. Zamakshari agreed that the jizya should be collected with belittlement and humiliation. And of course, all this is because Islam demands submission not just the submission of the believers to Allah, but the submission of the non-Muslims to the Muslims. And so they have to show that submission. And that means that they have to be humiliated in the process of paying the tax that is specified in that passage. There's a great deal more in there, but you see that it's a very extensive discussion on that passage because it's so important. I lost the sound. Oh, there you, you're uh, muted. I'm sorry. Uh, you've also mentioned something about the disjointed letters or the mysterious letters. Yes. Um, did you, uh, you know, invest uh, time in each one of these incidents, for instance, or did you use one example in your book? Well, the uh, of course, all the chapters that start with the mysterious letters, they're all they've all got them, and I refer back to the beginning of Al Bakara, the cow where there's an extensive explanation of the fact that in the first place, nobody knows what they mean. And they are often touted as a miracle, which is kind of ridiculous to say, because, I mean, what if I were to sit here right now talking to you and I say, ALM, look, it's a miracle from a law. I said, PHQ, it's ridiculous. And yet, there are, of course, Muslims who say that not only does Allah only know what these letters mean, but uh, the Tafsir al-Jalalain says th these letters are, oh, I'm sorry, not, not 
not Jalaline, Musin Khan and Hilali say these letters are one of the miracles of the Quran. Well, that's just it's just silly. Alif Lam Mim is a, is a miracle. Yeah, it, it is silly. And also some of the other explanations that it's it's only God knows their meaning. So why in the world yeah. do I have it if Allah knows their meaning? Right. It's supposed to be the clear book. So why is it that there's something in there that nobody nobody knows what it is? Anyway, then I quote Christoph Luxemburg saying that it looks as if these were notations from a lectionary. And that one of the reasons for the very strange organization of the Quran could be that it was based on a Christian lectionary. And, you know, a lectionary has readings from for various times of the year. And so if you were to pick one up and read it through, it wouldn't make any sense. You would be going from subject to subject because it would be cut up into little pieces for various parts of the year, various parts of the scripture to be read at various parts of the year. So Luxembourg postulates that that's what this is. And uh, the Quranic scholar Edwin Graff, Erwin Graff, I quote, saying that according to the etymological meaning of the word Quran itself, it is originally and really a liturgical text designed for recitation and also actually used in the private and public service. This suggests that the liturgy or liturgical poetry and indeed the Christian liturgy which comprises the Judaic liturgy as well, decisively stimulated and influenced Muhammad, or then I add, or whoever wrote the Quran, because I don't believe there was a Muhammad, but that's another story. And uh, the letters are indications for the people using the lectionary of where they find the accompanying passages that go along with what's there. Now, we can't tell what those are now, if this is the case, if this is a valid explanation of the mysterious letters, because there's been so much editing in the Quran. But it's the most plausible explanation for what the letters are in the first place and why anybody would want to put them there, that they're just essentially sort of like saying, after you read this, go to page 35 or L or M or Q, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I heard this, by the way, uh, that there is a possible connection to the Eastern Church, and that's why there are some of these um, disjointed letters that uh, will have a meaning. In fact, some even went on to explain that even the disjo disjointed letters in chapter 19, known as the chapter of Mary, does have actually indications of the, uh, uh, you know, Yahweh and the person of Christ and so many other things in there. I mean, these are just theories, obviously. So uh, let's let's close. I mean, I, I want to, by the way, uh, one of the ideas I have in mind is to bring you back and maybe talk about topics by topics from your book, one topic per show. But tell us about woman, wife beating and equality between men and women like the uh, uh, the Al-Azhar, uh, you know, uh, basically leader uh, recently stated. <laughs> yeah, he really is hoping to fool the unbelievers. But uh, the Quran is clear. And so in the critical Quran, chapter 4, verse 34, it says men are in charge of women because Allah has made the one superior to the other. And because they spend of their property, so good women are obedient, guarding in secret what Allah has guarded. As for those from whom you fear disobedience, give them a warning, banish them to separate beds, and beat them. Now, in the note, I note that a lot of people say it doesn't mean beat them. And so I go through. In the first place, I list 12 translations and explain what they say. So that if you don't like my translation, let's go to what they say for the words beat them. And we have Pikthal and scourge them. Yusuf Ali, beat them lightly. Halali Khan, beat them lightly if it is useful. Shakir, beat them. Sher Ali, chastise them. Khalifa, beat them. Arbery, beat them. Rodwell, scourge them. Etc. Etc. Go on and on. There's, there's, there's many, many. And then I explained that Lale Bakhtiar, in her translation in 2007, said, "Go away from them," instead of "beat them." But that that doesn't make any sense because it's a three-part warning to the women. First, you give them a, a, a actually a three-part prescription for the punishment of the women. First, you give them a warning. Second, you send them to separate beds. And third, you beat them. So you've already gone away from them in the second one. So she's saying you, what it is is you give them a warning 
you go away from them and you go away from them doesn't work. But also the fact is that Muslims, native Arabic speakers, and Islamic scholars have agreed that this is what the passage means. It's what the words mean. And consequently, it's there, obviously, in the usage of Muslims. It's understood because we have seen Muslim clerics speaking about wife beating and speaking about how it's justified in the Quran. So it's very uncomfortable for Islamic apologists in the West, but the critical Quran makes it extremely clear. There is no uh, room here to deny that it's got a sanction for wife beating. You're muted again. You're mute. Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, oh, you're saying I'm muted. Yeah, sorry. Uh, there is a person here that is asking a question about a person. I'm not really so sure if you know this person or not. I have no idea why he keeps insisting on asking you the question about this person. I think it's yeah, a German. Michael Gertzenberger. I see yeah. that. Yeah, uh, you know him? I believe I met him. I did speak in Germany a few times uh, about 10 years ago and again about eight years ago. I met a lot of people. I think I met him. I haven't, I haven't been in touch with him in years. I don't know what he's doing now. So I don't know why you're asking, but... Uh, yeah, so I mean, I want to ask uh, the viewer, what, what's the point behind asking the question? So could you please elaborate? So, uh, okay, so, uh, uh, you know, Robert, where can people get the book? And um, what, what is it that you like to advise them to do when they get it? Like, how can they navigate through? Is it a reference book, for instance, when as needed only? Can they go through parts of it right away? Well, yes. In the first place, I'll answer the second part first. It is a reference book, obviously. Uh, I understand not many people are going to want to sit down and read the Quran cover to cover and read all the commentary. You can do that. I think that it is extraordinarily revealing to do that. Uh, I uh, have been reading the Quran and studying the Quran 40 years now. And even just in putting this book together, I found things that I hadn't noticed before. Uh, at the same time, it's a reference when you see people coming through saying various things about the Quran. You can check them. It's got a good, clear translation plus the commentary that you can use. It's at Amazon. It's interesting to note that it immediately became the number one best-selling Quran in the Quran category. And this was oh. so upsetting, apparently, to Muslims that... Uh, it was taken out of the Quran category by Amazon. It's not mm -hmm. when is a Quran not a Quran when it's critical, when it's not fulsome, fulsomely positive and apologetic. So, in any case, it's still available at least so far from Amazon as well as Barnes and Noble. And it is yes, I, I did see it on Amazon. It is available. Okay. So can, there, can and a cat can a cat walk on it? Did, did David Wood do the cat walk uh, testing on it? Yeah, we haven't tested that. I don't have a cat, so. Uh, <laughs> We'll have to we'll have to find a cat and see what we can do. Well, that's wonderful, uh, Robert. Uh, really, I want to extend uh, the invitation to you that uh, the two of us maybe uh, since I have a copy, we can decide on one specific topic. We go through the notes, some of the passages in that chapter that deal with that topic, some of the commentaries. I'll bring bring in the flavor uh, of also some of the additional stuff that I have from Arabic sources. So, if you're open for that idea, I would love really to explore it once a month at least with you. Oh, that would be great. Sure. Absolutely. I'd be very honored. That's awesome. Thank you so much, of course. And uh, again, where can people go and subscribe? Do you have your own uh, YouTube channel? Is it named Jihad Watch or is it named yeah. after you? There is a Jihad Watch channel. It's nothing like yours. It's uh, it's it's really kind of, I, I need to make some videos. I, I haven't been, I've been neglecting this, but uh, there is a Jihad Watch YouTube channel, yes. And jihadwatch.org, the news site, is still there, still updated every day. And I'm at jihadwatchrs on Twitter. And uh, how often do you do this update with David Wood? Is it weekly? Yes, this week in Jihad on and Wednesday. What is it about, just, just for, for the sake of helping people? Is it about what happened that particular week? Yes, that's right. Uh, we just go through some of the news from Jihad Watch that week. And it's and then discuss what the uh, what this is working from in the basis of what in the Quran might have motivated this person and so on. And there is a website called the religion of peace that does things like this. Are you familiar with them? Oh, that's a great site. Very important resource. Yes. yes. The difference between Jihad watch and the religion of peace is that the religion of peace gives you links to a great many news articles 
at Jihad Watch, we give uh, fewer news articles, but explain more of the Islamic roots of this behavior. And so when there's something that happens, we will say, this is something that's based on the Quran. Like if some there's a story about somebody beheading someone, we give the Quranic passages about beheading, explain why this is so prevalent and so on. Yeah. We got the answer as to why that person was asking you if you knew that gentleman uh, in Germany, apparently a Muslim killed him peacefully. So oh, sure. that's oh, why. That's terrible. Oh, I didn't know this. Yeah, so it is sorry. terrible, of course. I wonder where the Muslim got the idea. Oh, okay. We this, don't we? Yeah. Well, uh, brother, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I'm sure you're busy uh, doing so many things and we appreciate you and uh, I'll reach out to you and we'll I'll give you even a suggested list of topics that we can discuss from your book. And we'll take it one by one. I think people will benefit a great deal to know about certain topics and what the commentaries are saying about it and what the Islamic opinions. That's what I like about, you know, the idea that you're citing their own sources. I mean, you're not giving your opinion only. Uh, there is nothing wrong with giving an opinion or, or a reaction or analysis. That's what critical thinking is all about. But mm -hmm. you are supporting it from their own sources and not just any sources. My goodness. I mean, I grew up hearing Ibn Kathir, Kortobi, Tabari. Zamakhshari, Razi, these are big deal names. I mean, you're taught these names at the university level. If you do a master's degree or a PhD in Islamic studies, these are the sources you go to since when they are discounted. That's that's the troubling thing to me. When Spencer quotes them. Yeah. <laughs> Don't stop quoting him, Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much again for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I appreciate you and I appreciate our moderators for taking time to do so. Uh, hopefully, I'll be catching up with you folks soon. I think I'm going to have, uh, I have to look at my schedule. I think I have another live stream tomorrow. And then the next week, I will be in studios doing a lot of, uh, you know, recordings, but I'll be doing a couple of live streams with certain people from the studios as well. So we'll keep you guys posted. Thank you, brother. And uh, we appreciate you. This is Al Fadi over now.